that we're joined by Solange Mongin for a review of the press. Solange, good to have you with us. Hi, Solange. Of course, the European elections are coming up uh, very shortly, in a couple of weeks, and the French press are calling on voters to take an interest. Yeah, the, the, the plea that the French newspaper La Croix is making on its front page today is Europeans ask for the program. The paper tries to help voters understand who to pick among a record-breaking 33 different choices that the French will have on May 26. And they go through the seven main parties and the different policy proposals to try and help voters see a little clearer. And the paper finds that many of the French parties actually agree on a few issues, such as the environment and a need for greater fiscal coordination, but that when it comes to the rest, it's really divisive, particularly when it comes to issues of immigration and a greater and greater European integration or not. And Solange, of course, we're hearing murmurs of um, certainly across Europe parties that are more affiliated pop, uh, with, with populism and the anti-establishment movement will be making rather big wins in the, these elections. Yeah, and that's why, according to the Global Mail, this election matters more than ever. The British paper says the risk of populism is why this vote isn't, quote, the usual Borathon, or shouldn't be for voters. Meanwhile, Le Figaro rolls out the numbers of a possible populist turnout. It says that one in four future MEPs could be from populist parties, as they could get some 180 seats. Knowing that, parties like Marine Le Pen's Rassemblement National and Matteo Salvini League in Italy are actually going abroad to try and create alliances and get past uh, differences that they have right now um, because they are a scattered bunch. And in its editorial, Le Figaro says that such division may be gotten past, which would make such populist and often Eurosceptic skeptic parties incredibly powerful in Parliament. Solange, we have seen this rise of the far right, the more extremist movement across the continent, and we have the foreign policy asking if there's any way of uh, stopping this. Yeah, they ask if there's a recipe or if there's if some way to keep extremist far-right parties at bay. And they look at three EU countries that actually don't have nationalists in their parliaments, Portugal, Ireland, and Malta. And foreign policy says that the three countries share a few things, a general confidence in the EU, a rather favorable opinion of their own political systems, and their economies have been doing quite well. But the site says that the similarities stop there, and that keeping far-right nationalist parties at bay is really, in the end, a country-specific thing. Now, I'd like to move to France, where we're expecting this Friday a very important meeting, of course, uh, between the Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president. What's on, what, what is on the agenda? Well, Le Monde tells us that mm. the meeting between the French president and the head of Facebook is not expected to be as affectionate as it was last year when they met uh, for their meeting. Uh, for since then, the French government has called for greater European supervision of social media in general and as well as taxation of major tech giants. And Macron's not the only critic of the social media platform, is he? No, in an opinion piece that is spilling a lot of ink in the U.S. press today, a co-founder of Facebook, uh, Chris Hughes, has written a lengthy op-ed where he says that Facebook, which also owns WhatsApp and Instagram, needs to be broken up by regulators. And he argues that Mark Zuckerberg, while he says he is a great guy, and together they built the site in their Harvard dorm room 15 years ago, he has too much power. For his influence, quote, goes far beyond that of almost anyone in the private sector or in government. And Hughes argues that the real problem here is that Facebook is following a tech giant trend in that it doesn't have any competitors and that breaking it up, breaking up its monopoly would, like in previous antitrust cases, create more innovation and options for people, not to mention help create greater oversight for the democratic and speech issues that have arisen, arisen with social media. I think it would be great to see some level of control over what Definitely. the content that we're seeing on Facebook and even Twitter. So, Lange, I'd like to turn to my favourite topic, <laughs> not <laughs> sports <laughs> news. The British press is celebrating some very uh, big victories in football. Yeah, I was a bit lost here too, I have to admit. <laughs> but as the Daily Star and the Daily Mirror tell us, Arsenal will now compete against Chelsea in the Europa League Championship final, and Liverpool will head up against Tottenham in the Champions League final next month. Now, for people like us who generally don't follow sports, this is 
is actually a really big deal. It means that this year there are only British teams on both sides for both finals. And this is the first time that any one country has managed such a staggering full house sweep in one season. Now, the fact that this happened this year with Brexit looming hasn't been overlooked by the press either. And Bloomberg says, quote, at least the nation is able to outfox the continent in something. Finally, Solange, increasingly we're seeing really peculiar things <laughs> on the internet. You've been taking a look at a Chinese woman who tried to eat an octopus raw on a, on a live blog. What happened? Yeah, this is from The Straight Times, and it's actually gone viral across much of the internet, so you can find it pretty much anywhere. And it has a big do-not-do-this-at-home <laughs> warning to it. Um, it's a video of a Chinese woman who's trying to eat an octopus while it's still alive. <gasps> which I learned is actually considered a delicate... Yeah, there she is. But it's not small. No, no, it's a real octopus. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, doing so is considered a delicacy in South Korea, even if it's known to be a choking hazard, uh, as the suction cups can actually stick to your throat. Anyway, this young woman didn't get as far as that. The octopus was naturally refusing to be eaten and forcefully stuck to the woman's face. And after a bit of joking about the octopus's strength, it, it sort of turned a bit stressful and painful uh, as it looked like the tentacles were pulling off her eyelid. And finally, she managed to get it off. Um, and she said she cried in the video saying that she was disfigured uh, because the octopus did manage to get some skin. Um, so did, did she end up eating that she octopus? Didn't. She is said a big it would question. be for another time, but I think <laughs> she's kind of scared for life. <laughs> Solange, Mujan, thank you so much for that press update. Of course, if you want to uh, follow Solange's uh, stories most closely, you can go to our website. That's www.france24.com.